Hi, good afternoon everyone. Um, thank you very much to the organizers of this conference for inviting me to speak and like some of the previous uh, contributors, I think that uh, the University of the Free State really deserves mentioning in uh, putting together this week. Uh, complex things of bringing together the Des Baker, the Sophie Gray, the Sci board meeting and this conference, something that has happened over a week but has taken probably a year to do by a small department of architecture, no small feat for those of us involved in architecture. Um, the title of my presentation, um, Rebuilding Community Architecture in the Age of Radical Transformation, uh, stems from a, a kind of an understanding about the loss of community that exists in our crisis ridden nation. Um, when I speak about radical transformation, I'm interested in the kind of coincidence of the moment of um, globalization um, and its economic imperatives for networking um, and the marginalization of the South in that, coinciding with our moment of democracy and how these two things are playing out in our country in kind of opposite forces and undermining uh, development to, to a sense. Um, so essentially, the notion of community has been contested in the way we've thought about it as discrete, coherent bodies of people who operate around some kind of religare, some kind of cohesive agreement. Um, and essentially, what that means is the relation between space, which we understand the, the kind of realization of architecture, and society is disturbed. Um, we're all seeking for a transformation. Uh, and the physical manifestation of that, um, but essentially power relations haven't really changed. So a lot of the work that we see iterates. It's very interesting how the previous speakers earlier this afternoon, um, how a lot of their work spoke about non-architecture and the essentialness of uh, the work or to engage is to understand the pre-existing social networks between people prior to understanding um, the ability to intervene. Um, in South Africa, um, the relationship between uh, the state and civil society um, is a fraught one. Um, it's best managed when there's an, a party that intervenes between that, sometimes an NGO, sometimes a civic organization. Um, and it talks about, A, the gap between the, the parties in power and those who are perhaps disenfranchised, um, but it also speaks about the clash of difference between the extremes that identify us our society. Um, early societies are very clear by the institutions and the buildings that are in the public realm that manifest that read clearly as types. Foucault's explained the prison, the clinic, etc. But these things are all con contested. Um, the earlier presentations look very much um, at commerce. And uh, on one hand, we saw malls as becoming new public realms. And very interestingly, in Mel Kral's presentation, the notion of migration of movement mobility and intermodal transit stations becoming a new form of public realm. Um, however, there's a lack of stasis where these things come together. A train station is not exactly a public realm, because what we need are meaningful exchanges between people that contribute towards uh, building society. Um, the further complication in this is rapid urbanization, uh, the increase in technological innovation, particularly in digital media, um, and also speed. The rapid things at which things happen, um, that they happen on the move, they're instantaneous, and there isn't the delay or the friction that builds a kind of a human bond between people. So both the notion of the sidewalk and the walking um, and the delay that comes out of that and chance encounters are kind of moments of resistance. <clears throat> the order of things that are represented in the, the, the physical landscape in our cities has not really changed. Earlier, the two earlier uh, speakers, the Deputy Minister, Minister Nell, spoke about the problem of the legacy of apartheid and its spatiality and segregation. Um, the, the lack of social cohesion in this country is directly related to the indelibility of the spatial legacy. 
Um, we can change apartheid laws, but it's much more difficult to change their spatiality. So the notion also through which the, the uh, early modern projects were built through the neighborhood unit is also uh, an invalid uh, model. Um, so it's both the social content and the nature of segregation that become problems. And so today um, what we have is private development exemplified by three bedroom houses, uh, gated communities and RDPs. Nothing could be further from community than this. So we, we qualify by uncertainty, a necessity to negotiate incredible extremes in identifying our architectural project, and using um, who, what we are to find agreement between difference. And I would say that that's what really design agency is. That's one of the strengths that we have as designers when we apply it in a responsible and thoughtful way. Um, and we start doing things in uncomfortable ways. I think the earlier presentations were very clear on that, that we need new methodologies and new ways of working. So the contemporary project of architecture is one of critical speculation, but it still needs to use the conventions with which we uh, are familiar. It doesn't mean to say that architecture is put on the side and we be just become artists. Um, I think some of the tools that we have um, that we don't think of that are outside of the actual architectural form are the power of sighting, of locating things, and then when one has that of in an architectural project is programming space. Um, and the innovators in that, um, probably the Parc de la Vallette competition was the most advantage of that, that start to re-script and reconstruct programming as an active design uh, agency in terms of bringing about new forms of collective action in the public realm. And this new spatiality has forced people or encouraged people to act in new and different ways that were uh, supportive of the new breaking down um, of the, the previous notions of community. Instrumentation um, is something that I think that we don't really deal very well with. Um, one kind of thinks about the star architect, the private architect, the individual as an author, as somebody that's kind of godlike. And yet what we really need um, to work is with other, for, other agencies, other instruments that form institutional measures through which we can relate and form agreements. It's impossible for architects to do this on their own, and generally those who subscribe to a formalistic uh, uh, approach to architecture, this is where the failure happens. So here we have the legacy of, pro uh, of the modern project, and in South Africa as well as everywhere where um, it's been implemented, the real loss is the social program. The reduction to the individual private unit and the absence of the space between that as space and as architectural program that has the impetus and the magnitude to make connections between people. Um, the RDP, the NBRI, and we see in that image with the brown there is the action of people in contesting the insular secularization um, of the individual unit in the absence of any socials in between. So we're caught in a process of progress, of moving forward, of change, and within that our society has to become modern. A lot of people have nostalgia for tradition, but what we need to do is to become modern without losing trace with sources. That's a quote from Ricoeur. So life is, is an active moving transforming, the word, one word that was used was metamorphosis. But it's not an arbitrary thing, it's about moving from one condition very specifically to an outcome that is embedded in the genetics of that which is metamorphosing. And essentially, our geneticism lays in the DNA of our socius, of our rituals, of the things that bind us together, of what we share. What differentiates humans is the ability to put the private aside and make collective action through the modification of individual action. That's what really makes us huge, unique, is this reflective action um, that allows for modification. Some people call it ethics. Um, so in conceiving about the notion of dwelling, and I think that when we speak about community, we, a lot of us go straight to these public realms or these higher level spaces. Public space historically is the physical manifestation 
of a set of conflicts. It's generally the resolution of uh, fights or conflicts between families historically or between nations or within a city. And the public realm re re reflects that, that resolution. In Italian towns, we have them with the church, the square, the market, and the town hall. A new set of higher orders, institutions, uh, become the representation of that resolution through which some form of communality uh, can work. When we think about um, the conflict between, or the tension between uh, modernity and tradition, in modernity, uh, dwelling has come to be happening in a house. In our society, a house is something that we buy in order to move through society to gain profit and to get a better one. Um, in tradition, um, a dwelling place is a home. A home is a place where I can come and from the marks that you've made, I can recognize your existence. So today that a house has to be a home as well, a dwelling place as well as an economic entity. We can't have all the benefits of modernity without sacrificing some of, modern, of, of tradition and vice versa. And so each project needs to really understand the mediation um, in projecting that rather than identifying itself at one side of the market driven. In tradition, what we had um, in origins was the notion of the homestead. A homestead was a viable, working, economic and social unit which built itself up to the level um, of the tribal community. Um, and as a unit like that, people exercise both ownership and belonging, uh, the tradition and the modern, um, the economic entity as well as the dwelling unity. And that's something that we haven't managed to really recapture. Some of the uh, uh, early presentations this morning in those mappings saw the kind of uh, contingent uh, responses in the way that the informal works. That's a response in, uh, in order to build um, a, a livelihood or some kind of economic opportunity to where they dwell. So the notion of living and working is fast becoming a new model of being in the world, not as an architectural answer, but as a condition of being in the world that needs to be reflected upon and responded to um, through architecture. So what I'd like to talk about is a, a, a concept from Aryan Apudara, who speaks about the production of locality in his critique of modernity. I, I'd like to talk about a situated uh, modernism. Um, and in his critique of modernity, he, he's, he doesn't name architects, but he speaks about people who produce locality through understanding space and scalar uh, conditions, rather than understanding the relational and the contextual. In other words, understanding the pre-existing conditions which need to be valorized, understood, accepted, particularly through when we're designing for people from other cultures and then projecting some kind of offering or new, nuanced uh, response to that in relation to the particularities of a very uh, particular exigency that deals with the community that, you, that you're working with. Um, so I'd like to just uh, explain that and maybe elaborate this through a few case studies. Um, this is Berlin, EVA, the International Ausstellung, where they conceived of the commemoration of Berlin's 750th anniversary through an exhibition, but not of documentation, but of built works. There were two dimensions to it. One was the reconstruction of the city, in other words, the remaking of the city, and that was done through kind of new urbanist tropes by the Kriyas. But the other one that's more interesting is that of careful urban renewal. In other words, rather than wiping out and remaking a new, um, in the way that sometimes modernity descends from the sky and clears the site in a tabula rasa. But it's understanding and then interpreting and then translating and through that transforming the world in which we work to elevate something that's considered as negative. Um, these were projects um, which were uh, individual city blocks, huge city blocks with the Mitzka Serna. Um, um, where the interior block had completely decayed. And it was done through the EBA organization, through invited competition, and then to be implemented by developers. So it forced people into a very real financial, um, physical, social, 
and political managerial uh, constraint that architecture had to uh, deal with. Um, what's interesting about Caesar's thing, and before it was pri private on the interior and public um, on the um, exterior and street, through the decay of the block, he's introduced four social programs. One being um, a school um, that straddles from um, the interior to the exterior of the site and anchors a public open space at the interior, reactivating that. Um, the second one is a, a communal studio, um, which is for the use of all the residents. And then the one at the bottom in the middle of the entrance is an old age facility where people who normally are vulnerable become the guardians at the gatehouse of the entrance for the public into that interior. Um, and the final one is the corner block where he builds this, this, uh, this housing unit. Um, so what we get is a contestation of a conventional perimeter block through programming, siting, and really reconfiguration of the block in order to build a socius, a life within the block that builds relations between people within that community and beyond it itself. However, that is highly specific to that community, and the real uh, genius here is the architect's ability to use their design agency to read and interpret that and then imagine something new that works within society. The second point I want to talk about is the notion of building community as mutually uh, uh, um, uh, uh, supportive relations. Um, this is a project between CHAC, the Stellenbosch Housing Action Committee, Development Action Group, and the, Stu and the Stellenbosch Municipality in coercion in 1989, and really an organized uh, 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 invasion of state land uh, in relation to people's frustration at that time of not being given housing conditions. They had wanted to occupy farming land and through a workshop with DAG had agreed to find a, a, more, a, 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 a better piece of land better closer related to the town and transport and also better able to be um, upgradable. And essentially what happened here um, um, was the ground was prepared um, for invasion in units of three people. Um, uh, uh, chemical toilets are identified, um, public spaces and commercial units are identified. In a sense, um, the marking of the land um, starts to suggest a network, an infrastructure network that can be upgraded over time. And with this community is maybe a very viable something that sits below for, between formal housing and the informal. That uh, urban design and architecture have ways in which we can start to deal with the reality and the energy and the capacity of ordinary people um, to build and assemble for themselves. And in so doing so, build in the capacity of community to be built by building together. A nachbar, after all, is a neighbor, which means a person who builds nearby. Um, and then um, also uh, providing the possibility for it to become, in time, its temporal dimension to be integrated into the formal dimension of the city. A more contemporary uh, project, which is um, trying to work with the informal sector, this one in Sheffield Road, and you can see at the bottom of the bottom road there, the northern piece there, is how they've been occupied at random the road reserve. So that brings up something quite interesting, this re-blocking, which is to work with a group of, of people to identify a, a number of families, to reconfigure them, to introduce public space and public facilities in order to elevate the informal. It's not to solve the informal, but through a very small cell, just to um, attend to a, a, a kind of a scaling up of that. You can see some of the earlier work that was done before the um, University of Cape Town got involved, which was really kind of random domino kind of things. And then the introduction of these actually not much different, just with newer mental uh, units. Uh, some kind of observation of local practices, where people wash, where they trade, where children play, um, how toilets operate, and also people's ability to go vertically. Um, in, in other words, understanding the latent potential embedded within the informal as an exercise of, one is, we, we heard earlier about topology, but also about skills and practices that have direct uh, uh, value in terms of, um, of upgrade. So this is a, um, um, a UCD PhD student's um, reading of the site. Um, the student did courses in anthropology and sociology in order to undertake this. The, the second from the bottom is a careful reading of the 
um, the nature of who's occupying them, what the condition is, and the nature of the spaces below. The very bottom line are outlines of the groups of families who have agreed to be re-blocked and reconfigured. And then the top two talk about a number of strategies. One is um, building a framework, a platform, a vertical tower. Um, the middle one is more interesting because it's gathering families around a private interior space and then public interior at the outside, a microcosm of the Caesar model, and that can also then uh, uh, verticalize. Um, so, um, quite an interesting proposal, but I think also bringing up quite interesting conflicts in that essentially what is happening is the public realm is being privatized. And I think that was one issue that I thought was brought up in terms of the tension of attending to people's needs who are poor, but in the end, um, you know, if the sidewalk becomes a commercial ground, what's the difference between that and the mall um, in terms of its privatization, the inability of people flows and, and, and that to move. I'm not saying it's incorrect or not, but I'm saying that whatever we do with good intentions, there's a consequence and we need to be attentive to that and have an, a reflective uh, action uh, in terms of the way we engage. The people's housing process was generated uh, in Victoria Minkanga uh, and changed government's housing post, uh, policy. Um, PHP, this one originates by women, saving, savings group, um, and then building one by one for each other in full trust that everybody would get a home. The priority here with, the, with some top-up subsidy was for the biggest envelope possible and then the ability for them in their, ability, in their capacity would be then to reconfigure the internal, internal environment for themselves. So also in, in working with communities and getting participation, we have to understand the skill and the capacity of that particular group. There aren't any generalities. Another group of women might choose to build for themselves entirely. Um, but each project has to be kind of uh, constituted through the bringing together of different actors and also through um, the understanding of the capacity of people to build for themselves and through that then to build community because these things happen in parallel. This is, we happen to be on a tour and we, we, we came into Langa in Cape Town as this was happening. It's a post-disaster fire uh, um, uh, uh, work that's been done. And what's interesting is it's been driven by uh, Department of Interior and, and, and Government. Um, the, 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 the orange green truck on the, on the left there is an emergency identity document uh, uh, um, produ production thing. Um, with, once you've got your identity again, you, can, you qualify for materials, a blanket, some cash, and some food. And that's the kind of process that's been played out on site, and where government comes down to the ground and meets community. So here's a very positive relationship between state and citizens, and it doesn't, there's no, uh, the, the Lange Development Forum, it's, it's, it's managed through a direct relationship with the community. The community is really, emerges out of loss, out of disaster, so they're clearly identifiable um, through that. And then we see at the bottom that the act of building is through uh, a level of cooperation and collaboration in terms of reciting and building um, together. This is another a, a, a community that I, I think, I mean, one of the things that's interesting is that since 94, we haven't built a new town in South Africa. We need to, new, we need to build new uh, towns if we want to contest uh, apartheid, or we need new models. But that hasn't, we've just built how many million RDPs? Um, so the, the Mansell Road project of Harbour Masson, of, of Rodney Harbour, um, starts with action on the ground of women coming into the city um, to buy a lot of quick kitchen and domestic equipment and to take back on the weekend. And that attracts a lot of uh, informal <laughs> settlement and suddenly there's this really bad or unhealthy informal settlement practice. So this railway siding just outside of Durban becomes a site for an intervention. And what's interesting, there are two interesting things here. The central uh, holding uh, a building is a bathhouse and a cafe with a mast, with a tower, markings thing. Um, because people arrive at midnight, they're hot, they're dirty, um, the trading happens mainly at night. So the, actually the bathhouse is the most important collective action. That bathhouse um, with its toilet facility is run by the person who rents the cafe. And he pays the city of Durban to run the toilet. 
the, the ablutions are one of the most problematic things as, in, 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 in cities, especially at a, lo a low level in terms of managing what happens. But this has been through a careful programming and siting of this building has totally inverted that relation and devolved the responsibility down to the community into a win-win situation. The second thing that I think is interesting is the model of the house that he builds for the traders on the site. And what we have here is a two-bedroom unit with a courtyard, a shop in the front, and an ablution that works for both of those, and then they stagger along the front. What, what is really kind of a, an urbanization of a rural model, and in the way the Maidan in, in India, or in, 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 in the Middle East, represents the desert within the city. Here we have the rural space represented within the city, um, within the, the urbanizing and a, a very interesting model that can probably be upgraded and quite an interesting seed for, for being developed. But it only exists in this project. Um, it hasn't been scaled or, or evolved further. Um, yesterday, um, in Dianne van Westesen's um, uh, presentation, he mentioned the VPUU. The VPUU is probably one of the most, or they're, they're a couple in each city, um, of a kind of a sophisticated form of community intervention. Um, this works on a number of forms, what we call co-production, where there's no single actor in charge, and it works essentially to create a framework that rather than hierarchical, there's a horizon of interconnectivity between the different players operating at the different scales. It's a project between the city of Cape Town, KFW, the German aid agency, SUN, which is sustainable urban neighborhoods, it's a consultancy firm from, based in East Germany, and KDF, which is the Kyle Lynch Development Forum. Um, it took almost three years for the first stone to be cast, to, to, to be laid. Part of it was to work with communities in identifying um, where the problem areas were, what the consequences of, of, of being in that area were, where solutions may, may, may lie, and through that it built capacity and it elevated the KDF in its local area um, to begin to intervene. After the identification um, of these places, a design strategy was emerged, but essentially what it does in the top, it joins from the station to an informal settlement, and it works through the interior floodplains, the kind of the water uh, overflow areas that are part of the part planning. In other words, the interior, the wasteland interior, which are the most dangerous, and it begins to invert that. So a route is made, and you can see in the bottom two left pictures what was before and was after. That route is marked by these active boxes at critical points. They are working at night. The programming of them at the top level is a community function. Um, one of them is a, a radio station, so it's acting on a 24-hour. So again, clever programming that updates the need for additional security. And the ground level has a program of SUN and, and, and play groups. In between that, then, there are different uh, areas. At the station, the, the program there is live-work units. Um, so people are living and working in situ um, and, and, and developing an economic base to be there. Here in the middle, in, in the Harare Urban Sports Center, there are these high-level order um, sports fields. Um, one of the programs that went in there is Football for Hope. So it also managed to assimilate other programs. It's around the time of the, the World Cup. Um, and a daycare center. So there's multiple representation. One of the conflicts that did emerge is that this was something that had to do more than just with the immediate neighborhood, whereas these, this community felt it was for them. Um, so that was also interesting in, in developing the community further um, uh, down the, the line. The last one is a, is a civic center, and it has a place where you pay your rates, where there's a, a library and a, and a learning place, um, a bulk place for informal to buy, um, 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 goods for, for sale, um, a pay place, and, and live work units. So it's getting all the recruitments of maybe the conventional um, um, uh, city as we know it, but the, the resolution of conflict is being fast tracked through this co production and this horizon of interconnectivity, and agreement is being reached before anything is made, and therefore setting a community in place. These are things we're not really trained to do or to see with or feel it's our responsibility. What it really means, a lot of what we've seen this afternoon, is that architecture has to be taught differently, it has to be understood differently, it has to be practiced differently. Provisional practice is, I mean, Okay. 
Um, this this program um, is another one which I think is interesting, and a new uh, Johannesburg probably is the most sophisticated in building new institutional capacity to deal with transformation. Blue IQ, um, JDA, the Johannesburg Development Authority, the markets company. In order to do that, the city has built things that mediate the public and the private sector or the informal sector. It's understood that you can't just do it in a conventional local authority. Way. You need to develop new forms of instrumentation. So local authorities modify the way it's constituted in order to deal with these contemporary problems. And um, the, the collaboration with the uh, European Union, there were a whole series of very interesting projects that kind of, in, in my sense, culminated in brick fields, um, and particularly the Savage Dodd uh, project. Where here we have a perimeter block social housing uh, program that's well managed, that deals with entry level uh, renters, uh, white collar workers, quite a lot. Um, but also at its ground level has living working units and allows not just for one means of, of ingress but for multiple levels which are managed by people who live in the uh, settlement. Those, those places also, some of them, as this matures, will be able to open up and the perimeter block become more porous. There are other innovations in this block, where it's in the tower block. For every three levels, there's a, there's a triple volume playing court at an interior, a crash at the ground floor, and some vegetable uh, and waste recycling. So that's very much consciously driven by the architects in trying to read the context and introduce new things in, but in collaboration with a progressive uh, institutional instrument from uh, the city council. But, uh, the last project I want to deal with is, you know, that this is also, there are interesting things happening within the private sector. And these are two projects in Johannesburg, and we have these huge uh, uh, lots with these oversized single uh, dwelling uh, um, edifices there. So here are two projects where the, pro the, the block has been reconfigured quite often through live work but there's been a completely reimagination of the privatization and bringing um, the public into it. In both cases they've got a road going through them which at this stage is a private road but in the future may become public. Um, people get parcelized the original house is kept, and a new uh, kind of collage um, that contributes to a new kind of urban impetus within a suburban landscape that start to set an example or a model of how the suburbs could be reconfigured, densified, and if we were bold enough, it wouldn't just be high income in, uh, 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 residents, but could be getting a much broader diversity of kinds of people uh, living within the, uh, that community. If it would be interesting if RDP was attached to that, if, if, you know, how, how um, one got benefits or these certain tax uh, things that can be um, associated with that. The last one is the Seven Houses Project, um, which has a street. Um, on the back of it um, are garages, uh, domestic workers' quarters, and studios, where uh, architects or artists or photographers or whoever's living there, they work it. So there's a street and it's activated on one side by the house, on the other by these little hybrid units. Um, and that can also, that's only one inch at the moment, but that can be reconfigured later. On the other side is a communal garden um, and people will move quite freely uh, uh, between each other and, and a communal pool. So um, this is not related only to social projects, but really it's a way of rethinking the way that we engage and how we use our design agency to start contributing to building uh, some kind of difference. We definitely need better skills in dealing or reading complexity and interpreting it, um, and then the ability to translate those to new imaginary uh, projects. Uncertainty is definitely going to be the, the nature of what we work, of, we go, of the way we move going forward. And what we've heard from the previous uh, presentation is that the unknown is the site of innovation. Um, that perception is something that's predicated on memory and the kind of typologies and solutions that we've lived before and become very comfortable with that, especially when we get out into the productive world. We need to situate our modernism by locating it within a, a critical reading of our history and part of that is to, in, in the notion of the South-South, is to understand other cultural impetuses. I think that was another uh, um, strand of, of thought that came through um, before. Our most powerful um, 
uh, attribute is design agency. And that is design thinking, which needs to be exercised through making and then in the representation of the final thing. Thinking, making, and representation, this is really where we differentiate ourselves from other people, and we can, provide, we can apply that, not just through form, through scale and, 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 and space, but understanding its power to build relational connections between seemingly or previously disparate things. And the ultimate thing then is to reconfigure space in the cause of community building. And that probably is a better way uh, of get, coming to spatial equity and space, spatial justice, is by not doing it through handouts, but by through building community, by working with the pre-existent and ex exercising our uh, uh, genius, <laughs> our kind of design capacity. Thank you very much.